Shabbat Shalom, everybody. You guys know my name. Do I need to repeat this every week? Noel Joshua Hadley. That's not Noah. That's not Joel. A lot of people call me Noel, fine. Call me Noel. But if you say Leon, I'm going to call you out for being dyslexic. And it does happen. And I find it really weird, uh, frankly. I'm just, this is my time, and I'll be on the, the therapist's couch for a little bit. My wife's name is Sarah. I have never once ever heard her, anyone, a dyslexic per person say harass. That's Sarah backwards, harass. I've never heard that. So what is it about the, <laughs> what is it about the name Noel that people go Leon? Like they, they, look, they look at that and go, that's a good name to say backwards, Leon. So I don't know. It's one of those mysteries of life. Speaking of which, the mysteries, we're going to be talking about that tonight with the Watchers released. So hopefully everyone has that pulled up. The Watchers released, and I would talk about it, but I think I spent the first couple pages talking about how this came to be. So with that, let's just get right into it. The Watchers released by yours truly, Noel Joshua Hadley. Didn't put a date on this one. I think I need to. And uh, the first part is called The Watchers Mud Flood Connection. Some of you may recall how the invitation to speak at the 2023 Sacred Word Publishing Conference in Atlanta, Georgia, was delivered on uh, TFR Live. Uh, that would be Truth Frequency Radio Live. Uh, that was when I was on a, a interview, a interview, getting interviewed by Zim Garcia. I don't even remember what I was talking about, frankly. I was de deliberating one controversial topic or another with Secrets Revealed host Zim Garcia, who also happens to be a friend of mine, when the announcement was made for his listening audience, more as a standing order than a request. And so just last weekend, I gave my first ever presentation on the Millennial Kingdom Plus mud flood topic. There were those among the TUC family who were witness to the event. Some of you are here in the room right now. And I think they will agree the presentation was a behemoth victory. I will say as a little side note that uh, I, I did put up the, I don't know if I was supposed to, uh, but uh, I did put up the, my presentation on my website or on my YouTube channel. Uh, Sacred Word Publishing hasn't put any up yet. And I don't want to step any toes. I found out that the reason they're not it's because they have two strikes against them on their YouTube channel. I have one right now. So, but two is pretty dangerous. It's pretty, it's like, it's pretty despairing because you get that third, you're done. They take you down. So they don't want to post like any presentations right now because they could be too controversial. So I was like, fine, I'll just, whatever, I'll put mine up. And a lot of the, the mud flutters out there, I think if they, if they uh, look at that, presentation I gave, it's a little over, underwhelming for them. It's like, yeah, okay, you know, you were just kind of brushing these topics. But, you know, the context here, we need to realize that this was an audience that many of them in the room had never heard of it before. They'd never looked into it. They would never even give it a second um, a, a second thought, the idea that the Millennial Kingdom happened. It would be like a passing thought, like, no, that can't be. That's just, Unless if, you know, you sat them down in a chair and you got a guy up there to present some stuff to them. So I'm, I'm, in those regards, I think it was a behemoth victory. Going into this, I knew I, I had an unprecedented, unprecedented challenge before me because how do you make a case for Satan's short season in a mere 50 minutes? It can't be done, and it, it can't. Attempting to convince the audience that 70 AD is where it's at seemed like a less likely success because far too many people are initiated into the futurist Zionist Israel eschatological model that you can't just shake them out of their sleep with the same scripture passages. Passages. I needed to take a backdoor approach. You know, it's kind of like you know the famous quote by Abraham Lincoln: "Both sides read from the same Bible, right? They pray to the same God." Well, it's the same thing. When you're, we all read the same passages, and you got one camp, and they're like, "Well, this proves the Trinity," and then you got the other camp saying the same scripture verses prove that there is a literal Son of the Father, and then you got you know one camp that's saying, oh, you know, it's it's prophecy, future tense, it hasn't been fulfilled yet. And then you got the other going, no, the, the, the clearest, most obvious is that it was a it was fulfilled in 70 AD. And you can't just jar somebody from that by just 
telling them. You know, you can't just shake them. It, do, it doesn't work that way. Sometimes you need to take, you know, a backdoor approach. You need to look at other pieces of evidence that they never considered before to go, oh, I'm willing to read, you know, look at this, examine this again. But then because I knew a certain segment of attendees wouldn't believe my MK conclusions anyways, I also figured it was a good opportunity to not only introduce such, such topics as the mud flood, melted cities, added time, or you could say missing time. I think it goes both ways. The world fairs, the hidden wilderness, and the moon map, but to deliver it with a single, somewhat coherent biblical timeline, which I, I hope I was able to accomplish. Really, you had to have been there. The, the live stream may document a series of slides in my dehydrated voice attempting to add legible commentary to each one. Actually, what you guys don't know, it was so bad. I was so dehydrated. Um, uh, if you guys saw me struggling to read the words up there, I'm like, what does this say? It's because I literally couldn't read it. My eyes were just my fuzzy. They were just really fuzzy. It was because I was so dehydrated. But what the, the video completely fails to capture is the sheer level of explosive energy in the room, especially the waves I was feeling from the audience while at standing behind the podium. There were points in the presentation when I could hear collective gasp, which you can't hear in the, the video. Some of the reports were that people's mouths hung open and all throughout. Afterwards, I was approached by many individuals wanting to relay recollections of their experience. One woman could barely hold back her tears of happiness. Others said it was the highlight of their weekend. To give you a contrast, uh, <laughs> uh, one individual, I won't say his name, I think he's in the room right now, uh, framed his participation in that he nodded off to sleep during every presentation but, but my own. Uh, those were his words. Though that still doesn't capture what went down. Because I kid you not, there appears to have been a rush to the SWP, that would be the Sacred Word Publishing Bookstore, during my talk, the back table they had. I didn't have a table of my own. I was supposed to, and I, I, I didn't. By the, time it, by the time it had ended, my book had sold out. There were those in the back waiting for my picture and a signature, while others were wandering about asking, where can I find a copy? Where can I find a copy? Nearly everyone in attendance had no clue what they were about to experience, except for, of course, the TUC family in the uh, splash zone in the front. After returning home from my whirlwind weekend, I decided to rewatch the presentation with the aim of figuring out what could have been improved upon, which is to say much. I mean, why didn't I introduce my audience to these two photos, the ones hopefully right in front of you right now if you're following along? What was I thinking? It could have only taken an added moment to do so. A picture says a thousand words, and I'm not seeing an exception here. The contrast between the exquisite architecture and the apparent thoughtlessness as to the roads they were traveling upon would be a stunning one indeed. These probably are my favorite two mud flood error photos. I don't know why that I didn't include them. If it were not for the obvious mud flood events, some of the buildings have collapsed, but that is likely because the sheer amount of energy from an, earth, or from an earthquake caused soil liquef uh, liquefaction. Let me say that again. That is likely because the sheer amount of energy from an earthquake caused soil liquefaction, which is, of course, a mud flood. And what do we see happening? Dumbfounded citizens are wandering about, attempting to dig their way out of it. So what I'm really kicking myself over is the lack of any reference regarding the watchers being released. There are 200 of them in the Book of Enoch, or Hanak, you know, buried within the earth. The thing is, when I am speaking to an audience from a stage, I can rattle numbers, uh, numbers like that off without showing the evidence because time is of the essence. Whereas here... I shan't, as, I shan't assume that you have the faintest clue what I am talking about. I actually, the, another thing I'm kicking myself for is that because I had to just rattle off numbers and I'm not like getting them out of a book, um, you know, there were a couple in there that I, I listened to it again, like, Ugh, I got that wrong. Like I just, I, I gave a false number. It wasn't, you know, correct. I, I, I'll give you one example. Um, for, for the entirety of the presentation, I actually didn't know what I was saying. It was just coming out of me. It was just like, you know, like I had this, the, like a, you know, an actor has to memorize the script ahead of time and you just, it comes out. 
And I, I meant to say December 23rd, 2012. And I said September 23rd, which is a reference to 2017, not 2012. You know, some people will notice that other people are just going to go right past them. They're not going to even think about it. Uh, where was I? Um, the best policy, I suppose, in a paper such as this one is to not assume and show you where I'm sourcing my information from. So here it is. This comes from Hanok, chapter seven. It happened after the sons of men had multiplied in those days that daughters were born to them, elegance and beautiful. And then the watchers, the sons of heaven, beheld them. They became enamored of them, saying to each other, come, let us select for ourselves women from the progeny of men and let us beget children. Then their leader, Shemi Yaza, or it should be maybe Shemi Aza, said to them, I fear that you may perhaps be indisposed to the performance of this enterprise and that I alone shall suffer for so grievous a crime. But they answered him and said, we all swear and bind ourselves by mutual uh, ex execrations that we will not change our intention, but execute our projected undertaking. Then they swore all together and all bound themselves by mutual ex execrations. Their whole number was 200, there it is, who descended upon Ardis, which is the top of Mount Hermon. There are other passages that speak of the totality of their number, though here it is important to ascertain there were precisely 200 on the top of Mount Hermon. Even Shemia Aza, whom they made a vow with, was numbered among them. You, you then have to flip the page, maybe two pages in some editions, depending on the book you're reading, to see what their sentence, see what their sentence is according to Yahua, meaning they committed a crime and they receive a sentence of judgment. And this comes from Hanok chapter 10. To Mikael, that would be Michael, likewise, Yahuwah said, go and announce his crime to uh, Shimei Aza and to the others who are with him, who have been associated with women, that they might be polluted with all their impurity. And when all their sons shall be slain, when they shall see the perdition of their beloved, bind them for 70 generations underneath the earth even to the day of judgment and of consummation until the judgment, the effect of which will last forever be completed. Then shall they be taken away into the lower depths of, of the fire and torments and in confinement shall they be shut up forever. What happened is that the watchers stood back and observed their loved ones, the giants whom they had begotten with the daughters of men, kill each other off in a war of the Titans. But then afterwards, Yahuwah bound them under the hills and the valleys of the earth, where they were expected to remain in total darkness for 70 generations. Well, then how long is 70 generations? I don't know and couldn't say. Most will claim it's something like 70 times 70, equaling a grand total of 4,900 years. But then there are others who insist that that equation is all wrong. Figuring out precise numbers has been a labyrinth for everyone who's taken up the task. The late 1700s to mid 1800s is a common range for many researchers. With 1812 coming across like a nice, clean, and well-rounded number. But then those are working with a Hebrew Masoretic timetable rather than the added years given to us in the LXX. If you are so eager to volunteer, then I will leave you to the imaginative math and the headache associated with it. Personally, I think the numbers given to us are a riddle. Uh, now, just if you don't know what just happened there, uh, you will recall that early in my research into the, the Millennial Kingdom, I, I, I discovered that there's two timelines. There's the, the Hebrew Masoretic timeline, which is what we have in all of our Bibles, pretty much. And then there's the LXX, the Greek LXX timeline, uh, which are, you know, very different. I think according to the, the Masoretic, really like in the year 5,700 and something, uh, what at least what Judaism declares. And then according to the LXX, we should be well into the 7,000s, 8,000 by this point, uh, to the point that Yahushua HaMashiach showed up in the year 5,500 versus the, the Masoretic when he showed up around the year 4,000. So you have that 1,500-year discrepancy, all right? 
And what I showed is that you have all these different books that take sides. Some books agree with the LXX. Coincidentally, those were books that uh, that Judaism appears to have never, they didn't want anything to do with those books. And then you have books on the other end that agree with the Masoretic. One of them would be the Book of Jasher. That is straight up Masoretic timeline. Um, and Enoch appears to be as well. It appears to be, you know, all these Second Temple era books, they kind of, they agree with the Masoretic. So we know what's going on there. That a lot of questions, and I just so you guys know I don't throw out a book just because it has a different timeline. I know that they were corrupted. So what I'm saying is I don't know if if you know we're going to really be able to figure this out. But there are more obviously way more intelligent people than I am when it comes to math. Anyway, you slice the cake. Seventy generations is a long time to think. What seems evident in all of this is that their release coincides with the Day of Judgment. Which judgment are we talking about here? That is why we're here. I will, <laughs> I will show you. One thing at a time, though, back to my original point. I'm thinking a release such as their own would have caused some serious seismic activity, hence the mud flood judgment event or a series of events. Maybe they weren't all released at the same hour. Maybe they were released some months apart. I don't really know. A great deal of many people have arrived at the conclusion that the watchers were released, but then they've also compartmentalize the hour we're living in, thereby demonstrating the usual headache of cognitive dissonance. Another thing I aim to prove is that the Watchers are only ever prophesied to be unleashed upon humanity after the Millennial Kingdom. So pay attention to that, because this is a very common thought. Uh, people all across the, the truth of realm, it seems like most of them are, have accepted that they look around at the world and go, yeah, I think the Watchers were released but then they don't want to make the Satan short season connection because if they do, they know what that implies. Their story is told to us in Revelation 20 verses one through three. The passage in question is quoted for you in the above presentation slide. I know it doesn't outright say their parole co coincides with Hasatan's at the gunshot sprint of the short season, though I am here to tell you the serpent is a Zazzle from Hanuk indicating that he is one of them. Don't worry, I will break this down for you. Before doing so, it might be nice to know why I'm including a picture of Mont Saint-Michel in Normandy, France, right next to the ominous Bible memory verse. I explained why in the presentation, but for those of you who weren't paying attention or weren't present, Mont Saint-Michel, according to its own narrative, was built as a monument over the very ground where Michael defeated Hasatan, thereby throwing his ass into jail. The battle, in case you were wondering, was over Great Britain. Now, if you go ask a tour guide there, they may not say that. And in fact, they have scrubbed that from some of their um, own history. Uh, they will tell you that it was built as a monument to Michael and a mysterious victory he had there. Um, uh, but there are people out there who have been more um, frank and honest about the fact that the victory was over Satan at a very pivotal moment in history in Revelation. The Azazel Hasatan connection. Hopefully I'm um I'm just gonna check this over real quick, make sure I'm not like uh getting choppy on you guys or anything. All right. Azazel is most probably Satan. Or you might even say the Satan, because I know that's you know, we all know that there's many Satans. We don't. I don't need to go back into that. Though I suppose what ought to be done in a situation such as this one, I find myself in a lot of these situations, is make the connection. Otherwise, you may not believe me when I mix up his antics with those of the Watchers. To be honest, though, even I am having trouble fitting the pieces together because it is Hanok or Enoch who not only introduces us to the character, but he also goes right out and throws the entire uh, premise that Azazel is Satan right under the bus. And you'll see what I mean. So it says right here in chapter 10, again, Yahuwah said to Raphael, bind, isn't that interesting that in this one, Raphael is the one that binds him. I didn't even pick up on that when I wrote this. So it looks like I have more digging to do. Bind Azazel hand and foot, cast him into darkness, and opening the desert, which is in Dudael, 
cast him in there. Throw him upon hurled and pointed stones, covering him with darkness. There shall he remain forever. Cover his face that he may not see the light. And in the great day of judgment, let him be cast into the fire. Right away, it's not looking too good for Azazel, cohort of uh, Shimi Aza. Probably shouldn't have shacked up with human women and then fathered children with them. It's moments like these where we can all agree, I told you so. On a side note, Enoch places his location of imprisonment at an opening in a place called Dude El, which is described as a desert. I haven't the faintest clue where Dude El is, and the internet isn't talking, if anybody out there knows. Dude El does have a wiki page, but its location is still inconclusive. If they know where Dudeel is, and we all know who they are, then our slave masters are not spilling the beans. I should say from now on, I think I'm going to say from now on, them, they. You know, fun pronouns. The thought, however, is that the entrance to Dudeel is located somewhere just to the east of Yerushalayim. And that it is furthermore uh, a region within Sheol. It's not my thought, mind you. It's just what others are claiming, and I don't know why. I'm just passing the information along. Won't somebody please whisper the secret into my ear? It sucks when just about everybody is in the know but me. Because really, I, I don't know. I'm just, dude, you know, I feel like I'm the one guy on earth trying to figure this out. Is it the abyss? Because that would be a sweet connection. If, you know, Dudeo is the abyss that we see in Revelation and other places. All that to say, the case is not looking so hot for Azazel. Uh, the Azazel Hasatan connection, though I am not willing to give up quite yet. I am actually wondering if the judgment pronounced upon Azazel was a promise for another hour, a distant one at that. For example, is Revelation 21 to 3 a parallel passage? It would make sense if it was. Hanak 10, 6 through 9 may very well be the same event, or more specifically, a pronouncement of the judgment event that will befall him at a later hour. The reason being that Mashiach's thousand-year kingdom of Shalom cannot commence so long as he is free to roam around. The jury is still out on that one. And so for your consideration, here is at least one witness in scripture which details the further exploits of Azazel, telling us that at a later time in history, he was still not buried within the earth. The watchers are apparently buried within the earth, but he's not. I should also explain, too, that... Um, with the timeline, you know, people assume that the Watchers were put into the earth when uh, when Enoch was alive. That goes against, I think, a, a lot of other stuff. I think it could have been closer to the flood, like another 13, 1500 years later that they were put in, that they were still on the earth. It was a pronouncement made. So it's really, this is why adding up the math isn't that easy on this. There's a lot of different possibilities. Anyways, I digress. And it came to pass, this is uh, chapter thir uh, section, chapter 13 from the Apocalypse of Abraham, which is one of my favorites, as you guys know. And it came to pass, when I saw the bird speak, this is Abraham speaking, I said to the angel, which I think this angel might be Michael, what is this, my Adonai? And he said, this is ungodliness. This is Azazel. So there he is. And he said to it, Disgrace upon you, Azazel, for Abraham's lot is in heaven, but yours is upon the earth, because you have chosen and loved this as the dwelling place of your uncleanness. Therefore, the Eternal Mighty One made you to be a dweller upon the earth, and through you, every evil ruakoth of lies, and through you, wrath and trials for the generations of ungodly men. For Elohim, the Eternal Mighty One, has not permitted that the bodies of the righteous should be in your hand, in order that thereby the life of the righteous and the destruction of the unclean may be assured. There is so much in that. That, that was an incredible passage. It just like, it just like, yeah, put this whole like package together, this world picture of what's happening. Hear this, my friend, and be gone with shame from me. For it has not been given to you to play the tempter in regard to all the righteous. Depart from this man. You cannot lead him astray. He is an enemy to you and to those who follow you and love what you desire. For behold, 
The vesture, which is in heaven, which in heaven was formerly yours, has been set aside for him. And the mortality which has which was his has been transferred to you. That's crazy. That's even just more crazy talk right there. In review, Azazel is identified as the ruler of this realm in that every lying Ruakoth derives from him. He sounds shady as hell if you, you want my opinion on the matter. Furthermore, every living Defesh soul has been handed over to him. Now, technically not the righteous, uh, you know, but there's a reason here. The reason being that the life of the righteous might be tested and the destruction of the uncleaned assured. Hmm. I wonder who that could be. Who is that describing? I really don't want to assume, but hmm. And look, I talk about this every so often. I had to throw this in. I I am even including some pictures of old Mr. Slugworth to help these, this argument along. There he is, the Azazel in the story, testing to see which of the children are wheats and which of them are tares and worthy of inheriting Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. Seems like a convincing locksmith case, though you may very well be that one person in the box who is threatening to hang this jury unless further evidence is provided. I will therefore offer you another somewhat lengthy passage from the same book. Be ready to sit and discuss it afterwards. By the way, hopefully, um, I didn't discuss this with uh, with Sarah E in the room, but if you guys have questions, please write them down. Hopefully she can collect them and we could uh, discuss uh, afterwards in a Q&A. So this comes from chapter 33. And I said, O Yahuwah, mighty and eternal, who are the people in this position on this side and that? And he said to me, those who are on, okay, so I'll, I'll describe this afterwards. And I described this before to the group that he's actually looking at a, like a picture. You can think of a frame. Uh, Abraham's looking at a frame and there's a picture in there, but it's actually a, a motion picture, like a modern TV. And I, I've commented on this that, you know, you can look back through the body of literature and, you know, people will claim, well, this is the first time that this like sci-fi effect was put into this ancient literature. Uh, you know, Dante was attributed to some. This is the first time ever in the history of any book, literature, whatever, that I see a television, uh, a, a motion picture, a movie uh, documented and told to us, and it's coming from heaven. You know, who is showing this to Abraham? It's pretty, it's pretty crazy. He's showing him a movie of the history of the world. Uh, okay, so and he said to him, those who are on the left side are those born before your day and afterwards, some destined for judgment and restoration, and others for vengeance and cutting off at the end of the age. But those on the right side of the picture, they are the people who have been set apart for me, and whom I have ordained to be born of your line and called my people, even some of those who were derived from Azazel. So right there... If you, you know, when you get into the serpent seed argument and in some people, you know, one of the things that really dirties the serpent seed argument is that there's, you know, uh, some people are racially motivated and they say, well, look at this whole people group here and they're, they're damned because they come from the seed of Satan. You know, uh, the, I, I think the, the black Israelites are really into saying the white people are the seed of Satan. And then you have some white people out there saying the black people are the seed of Satan. And I don't say either one of those. I never have. But it says right here that some from the seed of Azazel, all right, the serpent seed uh, will be declared righteous. Right. Just, you know, maybe these people are uh, whoever these people were, they had a much harder time uh, overcoming like Cain did. He never was able to overcome. But some of these people did overcome in the end and they were saved. Now, look again in the picture and see who it is who seduced uh, Chaua. That would be Eve. And what is the fruit of the tree? And you will know what what is to be. And how it shall be with your seed among the people at the end of the days of the age. And all that you cannot understand, I will make known to you, for you are well-pleasing in my sight. And I will tell you of those things which are kept in my heart. And I looked into the picture, and my eyes ran to the side of the Garden of Eden. And I saw there a man of imposing height and mighty in stature, incomparable in aspect. 
and he was embracing a woman who likewise approximated to the aspect of his size and stature. So he's basically saying they were giants, including Adam and Eve. And they were standing under a tree of the Garden of Eden, and the fruits of this tree was like a bunch of grapes of the vine. I've gone over that before. Uh, time and again where we see that the, the forbidden fruit was grapes. It was actually wine. And that, in fact, all wine today originates from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And standing behind the tree was one who had the aspect of a serpent, having hands and feet like those of a man, and wings on his shoulders, six pairs of wings, so that there were six wings on the right and six on the left. And as I continued looking, I saw the man and the woman eating the fruit from the tree. I've, I think I, I need to maybe do more research on angelology but to my knowledge i don't remember reading of an angel who had 12 wings right six pairs so six on one side six on the other i mean we know of the like the the cherubs will have like the the wings that cover their face the wings that cover their bodies and then i just went fuzzy there didn't i uh and the there we go and the wings will cover their feet when they go in the presence of the most high but that's only you know three pairs of wings anyways uh, 36 and i said who are these who are embracing and who is the one between them who is behind the tree and what is the fruit that they are eating? And he said, this is the council of the world. This one is Adam or Adam. And this one who is their desire upon the earth is Chaua. But he who is between them represents ungodliness and their beginnings on the way to perdition, even Azazel. Now I have spoken on the his story of the world as shown through the picture frame in other places, though it bears repeating here. We are often told that the horse in motion is the first ever motion picture. It was released in 1878 by Edward Moybridge or Mybridge. Well, my research states otherwise. Elihim already had one in his possession long beforehand. And as far as I can tell, Abraham was his first noted audience. There's only one painting which Abraham has shown, and yet the animation as well as the characters within keep shifting about and changing. In fact, this scene takes up the bulk of the book. He sees one scene after the next in there. There are people on the left of the frame and the people on the right of the frame. Azazel, as you can probably guess by now, stands among them. And what is he doing? He is seducing Adam and Chua in the garden. You see, he is the serpent after all, the same guy. Unless if we have two Azazels walking around, also, we see a clear confirmation of the serpent seed situation, but that's a discussion for another hour. I did want to comment on, oh yeah, and this ties in. The reason I wanted to go over the, the, the show, the first motion picture, which is, you know, a series of photographs that were taken of a guy racing a horse that they made, you know, you sped up, right? So many frames per second that I don't know how many frames per second the original one had, the horse in motion, uh, but this, this would also tie in with the watchers released. The mysteries of heaven. Guys, the motion picture uh, and, and cameras and computers, all this stuff, I believe these are the mysteries of heaven. This is coming down from heaven, right? That's technology from up there coming down here, and it's the watchers once again releasing them to us. All right, the watchers Hasatan connection. What I shouldn't, what shouldn't go. I notice we're on page 12 if anyone is caught up. What shouldn't go unnoticed is the sentence which uh, Shimi Yaza and the 200 receive in Hanuk, which is a completely separate one from that of Azazel. So they, the 200 receive their first, and Azazel is a different sentence. It's not the same as them. I have already gone over Azazel's Dudale adventure. But then again, the sentence of the others has also been shown. Their stories may be intertwined, but they are not the same. Just as importantly, Azazel is not even described as one of the chiefs during the Mount Hermon episode. So I have a lot of names. I'm going to try not to butcher here. Forgive me. Here we are in Enoch 7, chapter 7, verse 9. Actually, reverse that. It says 7, 9. It should be 9. See, I already butchered it. I already have a misprint right here. It should be chapter 9. These are the names of their chiefs. No, actually, never mind. It is 7-9. Never mind. I didn't butcher it. These are the names of their chiefs. 
Shimi Aza, who was their leader, Yurak, uh, Yurak Baram Meal, Aki Beal, Tami L, Ramu L, Dan L, Aski L, Sarak Ni L, Asa L, Armors, Batra L, Anan, Zavi, Z Zavibi, uh, Sam Saviel, Arteo, Turio, Yoma L, and so on and so forth. Um, there was a, uh, whatever, it doesn't matter. There was a Barak in here, I thought, but these were the, uh, the prefix of the 200 angels and the remainder were all with them. That comes from Enoch 7, 9. I'm not reading anything about Azazel and their in that flight manifest. There's even an Aramaic version, which is thought to precede all other Enoch texts. Ah, this is where Barak comes from. And that one even thinks to snub Azazel from the list of conspirators as well. So see for yourself. So this is the Aramaic uh, version of Enoch, and this is the flight manifest in there. We have Shemi Haza, which is uh, Shemi Haza. Um, we see an art uh, Kopf, Ramped L, Coca L, Ram L, Danny L, Zaki L, there's Barack L, like Barack Obama, Asa L, Hermoni, uh, Matar L, you go down the list, I don't need to pronounce all that, but Azazel's not there. Still not reading anything about Azazel in that one either, and that is because by all indications, Azazel never swore an oath with the others on Mount Hermon. He was already upon the earth waiting for them. And I've, you guys know I've covered this multiple times, how it ties in with the, the sons of uh, Seth argument and the sons of Elohim argument. I think that they're both consistent and they both tie in with each other. And might I add, Azazel was not innocent of their crimes. Hanok lists them out and they are by no means lacking in the evil department. So this is Azazel's crime as per uh, Hanok. Chapter 8, 1 through 2. Moreover, Azazel taught men to make swords, knives, shields, breastplates, the fabrication of mirrors, and the workmanship of bracelets and ornaments, the use of paints and beautifying of the eyebrows, stones of every valuable and select kind, and all sorts of dye, so that the world became altered. Impiety increased, fornication multiplied, and they transgressed and corrupted all their ways. I wish if I had spent more time on this that I would have, and I can always go back and fix it later, and just look at those two things. Because we see uh, Hasatan or Az Azazel is putting a, a huge focus on two things, war and vanity, like beauty from a vanity perspective. And that's really interesting to, to, to look at those two contrasts. It has been suggested that Azazel's cosmetology school was largely responsible for attracting the watchers to the daughters of Cain in the first place. As the Mr. Slugworth of the story, it was the ongoing job of Azazel to test the wheat and the tares among the angels as well as mortal humans. I don't know if people often think about that way. Like, I think he was, it wasn't just a rebellion with the angels. I think he was testing them as well, seeing how many of you are going to be true to the most high. That is just one of the reasons as to why I suspect the Dudeo judgment was totally different than what the fate of the Watchers entailed. Yes, I am thinking the Dudeo judgment and the Abyss pronouncement of Revelation 20 is one and the same. In fact, Yokinen may have even written it as a second witness, and it only would make sense that he would, assuming you'd make the connection. The next Watchers Hasatan connection has already been made in my 7,000 year timeline deception paper, though. I'm not certain anybody picked up on it. And also a review is always a good thing. You will, want, you will want some context. We are about to peer into the other bookend of the Watcher's Judgment, particularly their final end, as given to us in Enoch's or Hanok's 10-week calendar. This comes from chapter 93 of the book. Now, depending on your book, Enoch, this is one of the crazy things. that This could be like chapter 85 or chapter 93. They're all different. But the one I'm using, chapter 93. And after this, on the seventh day of the tenth week, there shall be an everlasting judgment. So this is the end of the end of the final, uh, the tenth week, the very end of the Bible story from beginning to end. 
There shall be an everlasting judgment which shall be executed upon who? The watchers. So, and a spacious eternal heaven shall spring forth in the midst of the angels. The former heaven shall depart and pass away. A renewed heaven shall appear, and all the celestial powers shine with sevenfold splendor forever. Afterwards, likewise, shall there be many weeks which shall externally exist in goodness and righteousness. Neither shall sin be named there forever and ever. So this is literally saying that when they receive their final judgment, it's the new heaven, the new earth. Sin is eradicated. That's that's the very end of Revelation. The watchers do not make any other appearance in Hanok's calendar other than in the 10th and final week. We know their aboriginal arrival upon the tippy top of Mount Hermon coincides with the seventh day of the first week. Seeing as how Hanok was the seventh of his generation and an eyewitness to the rebellion. And that they sit out the rest of his story in solitary confinement. Well, I would say at least from the, the flood going forward. I don't know exactly when they went underground, but it was before the flood. Well, it is only here that they arrive again. And guess what? The thousand-year reign of Yahusha HaMashiach has already transpired. The MK all went down sometime during the eighth and the ninth weeks. That's a rather awkward statement for those who insist they're back, but then don't want to deal with the other rather obvious conclusion that we're inhabiting Satan's short season of deception. The 10th week speaks of a renewed heaven and a great deal many cyclic weeks to come without sin. So, you know, you kickstart a whole new week or 10 weeks or whatever, a creation week starts again. And so what is the judgment which Hednok speaks of? I'm thinking it's this one. And they trampled over the breadth of the earth and surrounded the armies of the set-apart ones and the beloved city. Then fire fell from the heavens and burned them up. And Hasatan, who seduced them, was cast into the fire of Hashiol, where the animal, the beast, and the false prophet are, and shall be afflicted day and night from everlasting and into everlasting. Then I saw a great throne, which was white, and him who sat on it. And from before him, the heavens and earth fled away, but no place was found for them. And I saw the dead ones, that the great ones and the small ones of them stood before Yahuwah, and the scrolls were opened. Also another scroll was opened, and this is the scroll of life, to, to judge the dead ones according to what is written in the scrolls, even according to their works. And the sea emptied out the dead ones who were in it, and death and Hashiol gave the dead ones who were in it, and they were judged everyone according to his deeds. Then the death and ha Gehenim was cast into the fire, and this is the last death. And if one was not found written in the scroll of the life, he was cast into the fire. That comes from the Confidential Councils of Yahuwah, or Hebrew Revelation, chapter 20, verses 10 through 15. There it is. The release of Hasatan perfectly fits the timing of the Watcher's release, as well as their coming judgment. The judgment wasn't simply upon them, though. Much like Hasatan's release from the abyss, you and I both know they are intended to be instruments of judgments upon the persecutors of Mashiach's kingdom. Because elsewhere in Hanok, this is how the release is described to us. Now, I will, I, I think I will address this. I'll admit this is a little controversial as to whether this is the watchers being released or not. Could be dependent on the translation, but let's have a go at it anyways. And in those days, the angels, and I put there, the watchers, question mark, shall return. Well, what are these angels returning? Right now, again, there could be, it could be, you know, it could be the messengers, right? There could be messengers returning. Well, who are these messengers? Anyways. And hurl themselves to the east upon the Parthians and Medes. They shall stir up the king so that a ruach of unrest shall come upon them, and they shall rouse them from their thrones that they may rush out or break forth as lions from their lairs and as hungry wolves among their flocks. I think that's a perfect description of the watchers being released. And they shall go up and tread under, oh, this is actually better right here. They shall go up and tread underfoot the land of his elect ones. And the land of his elect ones shall be before them a threshing floor and a highway. Now, I don't make the connection. I should have put in here where in his calendar, Enoch's calendar, he talks about the righteous building their houses. 
And that's what we see all over the world, right? The cathedrals, and that kind of stuff. And what did the watchers do? They treaded them down. They took them over. They basically, it was like the, the whole earth was a threshing floor, like a highway. And they were just speedily hungry wolves and lions coming out of their den. They come out and they just take everything over. But the city of my righteous shall be a hindrance to their horses. Now, I think that this is a reference to the city talk that's talked about in Revelation 20. And they shall begin to fight amongst themselves, and their right hand shall be strong against themselves, and a man shall not know his brother, nor a son, his father, or his mother, till there be no number of the corpses through their slaughter, and their punishment be not in vain. In those days, Sheol shall open his jaws, and they shall be swallowed up therein, and their destruction shall be at an end. So, looks like Revelation 20 to me. The invasion of the city... Uh, and uh, that will be their final undoing. The part regarding the Parthians and the Medes is the only name drop which enumerates the confusion. It was probably added during the Second Temple period. In fact, this passage before you is the only serious offender as dating goes, and the very reason as to why the scholars insist Hanach was not written before the second century BC. So that's it right there. You're looking at it. They're like, this book, it could not have been older than 200 BC or 300 BC because of that reference. And of course, I put ridiculous here because number one, we know that Ezra rewrote the entire Bible, probably modernized it with modern terms. So uh, that, but, you know, some, a line like that was easily added, easily. Who knows what it originally said? The Parthians and the Medes were not, were not it, though. I mean, obviously, Enoch did not write Parthians and Medes. He wrote something else. But then you should also know that I place watchers between a pair of brackets complete with a question mark because there are ongoing questions as to whether Hanok is referring to the return of spiritual angels or simply messengers. The context and the giveaway is in verse 8, though, when we are promised that Sheol will open its jaws and that they will be at their end once and for all. That's Revelation 20 talk. Look at what happens when they return. They stir up the kings of the earth, rouse them from their thrones as hungry wolves and lions rushing out from the, their lairs, treading underfoot the land of the elect ones may be a reference to the historical land of Israel, but I'm thinking the world is their oyster by this point in his story. The fact that the world has become a threshing floor speaks of the souls handed over to them and the highway speaks of their speed of conquest. It is the cathedrals and the grand palaces of the set apart which they are which they are pouncing upon, claiming the outer darkness as their own. That realization is further realized when it is stated that the city of the righteous shall be a hindrance to them. Another parallel with the final assault on the camp of the saints in Revelation 20. And so I have something else to show you. Have you ever stopped to contemplate just how many meteor crater sites are identified upon the Earth? There's 190. Now, these are identified, mind you. You are staring at the Arizona meteor crater, by the way. I've been there myself. Um, anybody else been there? It is also sometimes referred to as the Beringer Crater and is located 37 miles east of Flagstaff. I can, <laughs> I can say I have personally visited the parking lot and visitor center, as well as the overly priced lookout location. But that is unimportant to this discussion, because what is particularly ridiculous in all of this is the meteor impact story. Hollywood loves to scare the meteor nuggets out of us with a good deep impact story, but then when was the last time that anybody showed one of these things coming in at a precise 90 degree angle? Probably because of the spin of the earth or whatever. And so we can't have that. Also, Hollywood loves to show rockets launching straight up into low earth orbit. Other, uh, other than the rainbow arch were actually given in real life. But whatever. The point is, I have yet to ever see a single meteor impact site which includes a streak mark, meaning they're coming in like this, like this. They're not coming straight down, right? It, they never show that. They always, if you come in like this, you're leaving a trail, like a, just a skid mark before its final resting place. 
you think they, they would, but no, because of the spin of the Earth, you know. The same goes for the moon. Every so-called meteor crater is a perfect acne scar, void of a streak mark. Are we to believe that every single meteor collided at a perfect, and I stress perfect, 90-degree angle over millions of years, and we are given no room for error? Gravity, that must be it. Yes, gravity. Case closed. Close the books. Go back to bed. Gravity. Well, then I will encourage you to try the experiment out for yourself. With gravity, mind you, because apparently we live in a realm of gravity. Borrow a BB gun from your grandma's cabinet and fire a pellet into the dirt. Give it 100 rounds. Your ability to create a perfect 90-degree imprint without a skid mark, even while failing to take into account the globular spin of the Earth and the moon, will not be easily achieved. Something else is happening. And by the way, I, I sometimes speculate that if when you look at the moon at all those holes, they, it looks like a pancake. You know when you cook a pancake and you put the, um, the, the pancake mix down on the hot pan and you start seeing the bubbles pop up? Right. Like I, I kind of wonder if there was like some like really hot event and it just like, you know, was popping. You see them all over. This one goes out to my Canadian friends. Yep. Another meteor impact site. This one is called Pingu Aluit Crater. For you Canadians, you can correct me on the pronunciation of that. Can be found in Quebec. It's another ridiculous is all I have to say about that. I stated this a couple of sentences ago, but it's already worth repeating. Something else is happening. Rather than taking you through each and every location and being accused of killing trees, because, you know, write this on paper, the red dots on this uh, equa rectangular projection represent the X marks the spot of each and every identified meteor impact site on the Earth. Quite a lot in Australia and Northern Europe, whereas I'm seeing little of any activity in the Middle East. Hmm. Some of my uh, Israel's not the real location people will love that one. If only I had shown this one at the Atlanta conference. See, so many lost opportunities for slides. It would have only taken a minute. I am thinking what needs to be done is an entire weekend seminar focused exclusively upon the Millennial Kingdom plus mud flood conspiracy. It would take a weekend and still you wouldn't even cover the whole thing. Not even close. If only somebody would plan one and then invite me to speak. An hour is nice, but then again, so are several of them. Dreams do come true. One theory is that we may be looking at the fountains of the deep, which opened up during uh, Noah's flood. I am not disregarding it. That, that could be true. What I am proposing, however, has something more to do with Satan's short season. With 200 watchers imprisoned within the hills and the valleys of the earth, are these the places of their imprisonment? Is this what they rushed out of? I had started out talking about the amount of energy needed to create a worldwide mud flood event, and this might be it. Only 190, though. Are we having a close but no cigar moment? The 190 are those that, identif that are identified above sea level, FYI. Antarctica is suspiciously lacking. There may be others. There could easily be 10 more. Won't somebody invite me to another engagement so that I might propose my theory in person? I'm not through, though, yet. I have another number for your consideration. There are 195 recognized countries in the world today, which includes the UN, non-member observer states, the Vatican, and Palestine. The UN logo comes complete with a laurel wreath, which surrounds the portion which they control of the greater realm. When you look at the moon map, you can see that there is a portion of the world they do not control, but this is what they do control, the only part of the world we're allowed to travel to. Once again, we are short of the 200, stuck within another close but no cigar moment. Hmm. Perhaps a few of the watchers got bumped off along the way, LOL, or else they're preoccupied running the ABC and the music and Hollywood talent agencies. All right, the Watchers and the 70 Connection, I actually would like to spend a lot more time on this as well because I barely tap into the, the 70 here, but uh, this will definitely be worth your consideration as the, because we all talk about the 70 historically, but I have yet to hear anybody comment 
on the 70 presently. And before I get into this, I just realized I need to pour myself some more drink. I guess we'll have to wait a minute. All right. It's tea, by the way. I'm ditching coffee tonight. This coffee misses me up. I don't want to go to bed. Come to think of it, there is no connection between the Watchers and the 70. Between the Watchers and the 70, that is. Only a moment ago, I mentioned the 195 recognized entities in the United Nations, and it got me thinking. It seems to me that the 70 Elohim spoken of in Devarim or Deuteronomy 32.8 are no longer in the equation at this point in his story. The Deuteronomy passage involves the same divine beings associated with the 70 nations and their 70 corresponding languages. Yeah, remember them? How quickly we forget. So it looks like I'll read from the LXX here, and that's the one on the left. When the Most High El Elyon divided the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the nations according to the number of the angels of Elohim. And his people, Yaakov, became the portion of Yahuwah. Yasharel was the line of his inheritance. And then we see on the, the oh, this is the Targum, the Aramaic Targum on the right. When the Most High made allotment of the world and to the nations which proceeded from the sons of Noah, in the separation of the writings and languages of the children of men at the time of the division, he cast a lot among the 70 angels. The, prince of the, the princes of the nations, like where we get Prince of Persia, the princes of the nations with whom is the revelation to oversee this city, even at that time. He established the limits of the nations according to the sum of the number of the 70 souls of Yasharel who went down into Mitzrayim. And when the holy people fell to the lot of Yahuwah of all the world, Mikael opened his lips and said, let the good portion of the name of Yahuwah's words be, word be with him. Uh, Ga uh, Gabriel opened his lips with thanksgiving and said, let the house of Yaakov be the lot of his inheritance. What happened to the 70 divine beings and why are they no longer ruling over humanity? Hmm. Racking up their non-existence to the short season of Hasatan is my best guess. Further evidence that the millennial kingdom has come to its end. You will recall that the Watchers event happened at at least a thousand years before Noah's flood. Certainly long before El Elyon divided up the nations of Babel. Solitary confinement insisted that they miss out on co-rulership, but now Azazel's old drinking buddies are back in town. Just when we thought he was beginning to behave himself too. Now, their arrival still doesn't satisfy the regime change question though. We are given some clues. The first arise from a favorite chapter of mine, though it is rarely quoted. It can be found in Hanuk of all places, and so I will give you some of that needed context. Yahuwah's handing Yasharel a bill of divorce in Yahuwah chapter 3, or Jeremiah 3, is the time frame. You guys know I talk about the divorce a lot. Another favorite talking point of mine. Because presumably the sheep of Yasharel are not only being vomited from the land, but they are also being delivered into the care of the 70. That's a crazy thought that they were handed these other gods to rule over them. And so this comes from chapter 89. And you can see it's a long chapter because I'm starting on verse 94. He also called 70 shepherds and gave those sheep to them that they might pasture them. And he spoke to the shepherds and their companions let each individual of, of you pasture the sheep from now on, and everything that I shall command you, that do you. And I will deliver them over to you duly numbered and tell you which of them are to be destroyed, and them you will destroy. And he gave over to them those sheep. And he called another and spoke to them, observe and mark everything that the shepherds will do to those sheep. So he's got like a courtroom, um, you know, person documenting this now, typewriter, he's writing on scrolls, like every single thing that they do. For they will destroy more of them than I have commanded them. So Yahuwah already knows that these, these guys will not be, or I should say the Most High uh, already knows that they will not 
uh, be ruling justly over them. This is straight out of Psalm 82. And every excess and the destruction which will be done through the shepherds, record how many they destroy according to my command, and how many according to their own caprice. Record against every individual shepherd all the destruction he effects. And read out before me by numbers how many they destroy and how many they deliver over for destruction, that I may have this as a testimony against them. And know every deed of the shepherds, that I may comprehend and see what they do, whether or not they abide by my command, which I have commanded them. But they shall not know it, and you shall not declare it to them. Now admonish them, but only record against each individual all the destruction which the shepherds effect each in his time and laid all before me. I'm almost wondering here if he's saying, I'm not quite sure, if he's saying that they shall not know that, I, that you are actually recording this all down for me and that they're going to be held accountable to it. It's almost like these, these creatures, these, these Elohim think that they're just they're not going to be count, called into account. They can just do what they want. They're like, that's nice you're saying that, but I got it. This is my inheritance. I can do what I want with it. And the shepherds and their associates delivered over those sheep to all the wild beasts to devour them. And each one of them received in his time a definite number. It was written by the other in a book how many each one of them destroyed of them. Hanok 89.94.101. The instructions given to the divine council of the 70 involves a strict code of conduct as to who they were allowed to destroy and preserve among dispersed Yasharel, each according to Elohim's commands. It plays out very much like Azazel's earlier established role in Apocalypse of Abraham. Azazel is purposed to test the righteous to see if they are counted worthy, whereas the destruction of the wicked is assured through him. With Hanok 89, A court uh, stenographer is even included in the confrontation so that lists might be made, rec records jotted down, and names taken. Well, it appears as though the shepherds became drunk on the blood of the sheep immediately after their delivery. They devoured whomever they desired, and in the end, it cost them. Further indication of their impending doom is given to us in Psalm 82. Elohim stands in the assembly of the mighty. He judges among the Elohim. How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Selah. Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, ye are Elohim. And all of you are children of El Elyon, but you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O Elohim, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all nations. Arguments unfold as to the meaning of the 82nd Psalm, but this is my Bible study, and I say it incites the divine council in heaven as well as the 70 Elohim over humanity. If you don't like my conclusions, then be sure to whip up your own book report for the teacher. A lot of people are saying, you know, that they're it's referring to the Sanhedrin or whatever. Uh, though I am more than willing to accept that the 70 were represented by human counterparts in various Goim thrones as well as by the Sanhedrin. So, you know, quickly, for those of you who, who were here Thursday night when uh, when Sean was talking, about his history in um, uh, the Cree the tribe and, and shamanism. And I had like the epiphany during the interview because I was thinking about this. And, you know, he's talking about how in, in, in Canada and in, in North America, amongst the tribes, they had dwarves, they had leprechauns, they had, you know, like these Smurf creatures, like the, the brownies, you know, the, the sprites and all, you know, they had, you know, Sasquatch, all these things, the things you see all over the world. And I was thinking about this, and so you see the commonality all over the world, but but it's it's almost like uh, what I had said was is that did did uh, did these fairies adapt to humanity, or did humanity adapt to them and the Elohim? You see what I'm saying? 
It's almost like it's different cultures of the same beings. And those, those people spread all over the earth adapted to the spiritual world. Hopefully that makes sense to you. Um, the, the problem is that they, the Sanhedrin, were not ruling with the Torah as their guide. Or I should say the Elohim as well. It is the Torah which they would be judged by. Ultimately securing a fate which involves their dying as men. The Elohim would die as men. They would be thrown into the fire. Yehusha HaMashiach actually quoted from it in Yochanan 1034 that he quoted from Psalm 82. The reason being an obvious one if we read Psalm 82 to its end. It points back to himself. He's, he's at the very end there where it says, Arise, O Elohim, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all nations. So he's handed out to the 70. They screwed it up. And the one guy who comes along and does it right, he's like, you get all the nations. They're all yours. Further implicating the Yahuwah Yahusha connection to be a true one. As you guys know, I'm really thinking through that. Uh, Pamela and Michael presented on that. I think it, it's a pretty good case that Yahuwah and Yahusha are the same, uh, but they're not El Elyon. Because if you recall, El Elyon divided up the nations, not Yahuwah, and the lot fell to Yahuwah. Uh, in Canaan, thereby informing us that he was numbered among them. He was actually numbered among the 70. And at any rate, the Elohim being spoken of, Yahuwah Yahusha, was promised to arrive and judge as well as inherit all nations of the earth. Mashiach did that. He kept the Torah, being obedient, obedient even unto his death, and was worthy of resurrection whereas the other council members were given no such promise at all. I mean, you think about it, Yahuwah is the only one. He makes a covenant with man, with Abraham, and his descendants don't keep the covenant, but he comes through in the end and be like, I'm going to, I'm going to uphold this covenant. I'm going to live according to the Torah of, of the father of all spirit, of all Ruachoth. I'm going to uphold this. I'm going to live it. And he then is handed the entire world. This is, he becomes the king of the world. I have yet to find a single passage, passage of scripture which documents the final demise of the 70. Until I can be shown otherwise, I am of the opinion that their judgment has already come. The changing of the guard most notably arrived with Yahusha sending out of the 70 emissaries, though their number reaches 72 in some accounts. It just so happens to be another one of my slides in the SWP Atlanta conference. Yahusha instructed them in Lucas 10 to go all throughout the world, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, adding, it shall be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city who rejects his mission. That's a straight up threatening message to the 70 and on par with Psalm 82, in my opinion. I mean, he, he's sending them out. He's like, the message was to the Elohim. I'm, I'm in control now. I'm inheriting the earth. All this is being handed over to me, accept me as king. And if you don't accept me as king, then you're going to be burnt up. Again, the message is for the, the Elohim. And I, I sometimes wonder, you know, in the, the correlation between the Elohim and the people, that if you actually have entire nations, like Great Britain, as I pointed out, that converted very early on, does that actually speak for the Elohim ruling over it? Did the Elohim also convert? I know we don't think in this way, but what if some of them, of, of the 70, actually handed over their crowns, their authority to Yahushua HaMashiach? And we're, we're, we don't really know. It's just speculation. We just think that they all, you know, they all just were evil and they got thro thrown into the fire. Maybe, maybe not all of them. As you can see, the cities which embraced the gospel were greatly rewarded during the thousand-year reign. That is my theory at any rate. Contrarily, the cities which rejected the gospel were burnt to a crisp. We have documented proof of the melted cities all across the realm, but that is another presentation slide altogether, and you guys know about that. You had to have been there, I guess. The point is, it, it was Yahushua's perfect right to judge, the 70. Psalm 82 tells us so. That moment arrived when he inherited the entire earth. Every angelic prince who opposed him was toast. I think they went up with the city. Jam and butter couldn't even fix that mess. 
It would take the release of the watchers to trample over the grand palaces and cathedrals of his elect ones again. So you, you guys just paying attention to the timeline here. More proof the millennial kingdom has happened. 70 are done. They were done at the beginning of the kingdom. He comes in with his kingdom. He establishes over the whole earth. This is mine. And then the watchers come and they take it over again, right? And he, you know, and the saints, they sail off for the hidden wilderness or wherever. You can see this whole picture forming here. And it just, it makes more sense to me than anything else. All right, what do we have left? All right, worthless uh, mysteries, my conclusion. This is a really quick little short conclusion here. On the day my, uh, on the day my grandmother died, I remarked, she was born while mankind was still fighting wars on horseback. She was, you know, born uh, before World War One, and yet she lived to see not only man landing on the moon, but the internet. Disregard the moon quip; <laughs> it's a minor fallacy. It transpired as part of the deception, and the point still stands. I, you know, that was back when I believe we landed on the moon years ago. Consider all that has come our way since the release of the Watchers. Within the lifespan of only two or three generations, the world was introduced to evolution, theosophy, transhumanism, spiritism, tongue babbling, kundalini, new ageism, a hundred Codex Sinaiticus Bible translations, eugenics, scientism, archaeology, Nietzsche, Freud, outer space, deep space telescopes, Satellites, flying saucers, aliens, science fiction, the atomic age, biochemical weapons, germ theory. Snack time! Oops, did I just say that? Cookie, cookie, cookie! Uh, <laughs> I'll take a little mental note. Let's go back and erase that. Fluoride. Airplanes, automobile, automobile, uh, automobiles, chemtrails, the Federal Reserve, world wars, Zionism, the Bolshevik Revolution, communism, the CIA, and really the intel communities as a whole, really formed majorly back in the 1800s into the 1900s, movies, transistor radio, television, MK Ultra, Intel hoaxes, and psychodramatic episodes on a worldwide scale, computers, video games, the internet, and I've barely begun to dig in. Beginning in the 19th century, the mysteries of heaven exploded upon the earth. I mean, you talk about the days of Noah. The, the, Nepha, the Nephilim people love to talk about how the days of Noah is going to include Nephilim. They completely disregarding the last 200 years. That the days of Noah, like the, the mysteries of heaven have come down again. They've rediscovered all this stuff all over again. But then consider what happened on the first go around. Before throwing the watchers into the darkness of their confinement, Elohim relayed the following message through Hanak, his prophet. You have, and you guys know this is one of my favorite scripture verses. You have been in heaven, but all the mysteries had not yet been revealed to you, and you knew worthless ones. And these and the hardness of your hearts you have made known to the women. And through these mysteries, women and men work much evil on earth. It's almost like he's saying that the most high is like saying, you know, you, th you think you're the master. You're still the student. There's a lot you don't know, and you're not going to learn it now. Seventy generations until their release. Ironically, it all appears to coincide with the timing of Hanok's rediscovery again. Hmm. This shouldn't surprise anyone. Since Hanok opened his book with the following warning. And I heard everything from them and I saw and understood, but it was not for this generation to know, but for a remote one, which is to come. Enoch or Hanok 1 2. All right, that's it for that paper tonight. And if you guys have questions, please write them down. I did not see any of them as they were posted, but. Uh, I do have, uh, I think Sarah's here tonight. Sarah E, good. Hopefully she can write them down, come up when we're done. Uh, I'm going to start reading through part two tonight, my other paper. And this is called The Sasquatch and Johnny 